Cotton Foundry, which he purchased, which he purchased in 1878. There he made steam sawmill equipment and uh, began developing new devices such as uh, for manifolds for uh, steam heat and other devices. His nephew, John Reed, came to live with he and his oh. wife. And the time- um, No, he's out, he's out mulching. Oh. <laughs> and then um, they um, uh, I'm cool. became a, also an interest in mechanics. Uh, yes, what, they were delicious, thank you. Please uh, mute your microphone for all of those of you in the audience, please. What? <laughs> uh, Joseph Reed oh. was convinced no, that an engine could be made that would use crude oil or natural gas to pump oil wells. He studied various patents and designed a two cycle engine powered, which powered his shop in 1892. The engine needed to have an oil field engine needs to have rugged construction, simplicity in design and adaptability to pump or drill. And it needed to be reliable and economical. A company catalog states that the first engine left the plant December 1st, 1894. This machine greatly was greatly improved and thousands were in daily use within a few years. Uh, nicely balanced power was one of the, the machine could pump as many as 20 wells with a remarkably small consumption of gas. They uh, started advertising in 1898 and changed the company name to the Joseph Reed Gas Engine Company. So this was the type A and Drake well has one it, with, uh, that we acquired for the Commonwealth with McClintic well number one which is the oldest oil well in continuous production in North America. So this is a, a 15 horsepower. And we also have an eight horsepower, which originally pumped all the wells on the Drake Well Museum property. <clears throat> so there's a number of talented engineers and uh, nephew John eventually became the president and joined that previously uh, working as an engineer developing all sorts of patents and the Joseph Reed Gas Engine Company contains many of those patents as well as the research documents and all of the engine studies, engineering studies, mechanical drawings that went into uh, creating these different engines and some of the different machinery. A lot of the advertising that we have um, is also used by numerous researchers who uh, love gas engines. And they, um, Joseph Reed Company developed a full line of equipment. And this type C Reed Terrier engine was developed in 1927. It's a two cycle engine with an enclosed governor and almost completely closed design, making it perfect for the sandy conditions found in the mid continent oil fields. And of course, our collection contains a Reed Terrier. With its fancy red and gray palette of colors, it certainly would dress up an oil field. Most were sold, most of this type of engine were sold through the Frick and Reed Supply Company that was developed in the 1920s to market the Reed products in the Oklahoma and Texas fields. So this 18 horsepower Reed type DR gas engine, two cycle, single cylinder, uh, came to us from out west before it migrated back to Pennsylvania. This 80 horsepower Reed engine, twin cylinder, was used on the National Transit Company's oil trunk pipeline, which helped push the oil from the Bradford oil fields to the Standard Oil Company refineries in New Jersey. So beside the papers and engines, the Reed collections also contain personal items like John Reed's cowboy hat worn at the International Petroleum Exposition and annual Tulsa Rodeo held May 14, 1921. This hat, hat obviously features the Frick and Reed Supply Corporation brand, highlighting the merger of the two companies to increase the sale of the engines. 
advertising, name tags, and calculating rod disc are all part of the collection as well. The disc uh, enabled a producer to calculate the approximate horsepower to pump an oil well. By rotating the discs, you could figure out the average horsepower required to pump a well of a depth of certain feet. And this device was also used by the engineers at, at, at uh, Reed Manufacturing to calculate engine speeds and other mathematical tabulations needed by the engineers. Mechanical engineering tools, drawing sets and curves of different sizes and types were also used by John Reed and his son George and are part of the collection. Though the Joseph Reed Gas Engine Company closed in 1939, Reed engines remain in use today on oil leases in Pennsylvania, still pumping, though many of them have now retired to people's trailers and are shown at engine shows like this one was at Drake Well Museum a few years ago. So that's my favorite set of objects at Drake Well Museum. Susan, just out of curiosity, when you said there was a merger and it became Frick and Reed, is that the same Frick of Pittsburgh? I don't think so. It was because this was based in Tulsa, Oklahoma and had no ah, Pittsburgh affiliation. Okay. okay. And it was a, a, a not a full merger. The Joseph Reed Gas Engine Company remained a separate company, but then they formed that partnership to help market various oil field tools in the mid-continent field. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you, Susan, for sharing the, uh, the Reed co um, collection. So as we go through the alphabet, uh, next comes Linda presenting Blue Star Objects from the Erie Maritime Museum. So, and by the way, a colleague reminded me, uh, we are uh, recording this uh, program for posterity. So if you do not wish to be recorded, you may uh, want to leave the uh, program, but if not, no, we are recording it. So uh, Linda, uh, the screen is yours, take it away. Okay. And uh, there we go, screen sharing. Uh, bear with me a section, sec, uh, second here uh, while this uh, comes back back on. Ah, there we go. Okay, um, well, good evening. I'm Linda Bola with the uh, Erie Maritime Museum. And today I'd like to share a small group of objects tied to a couple of men who served in the USS Wolverine. Now launched in 1843, Wolverine began her 80 year career as USS Michigan the US Navy's first iron steamer. In 1905, her name was changed to Wolverine. And in 1912, the Navy decommissioned her. At that point, the ship was turned over to the Naval Forces of Pennsylvania, otherwise known as the PA Naval Militia. Wolverine served as the headquarters for Division C and D of the PA Naval Militia Divisions A and B were headquartered at Navy Island, now the Philadelphia Navy Yard. The men who trained and prepared during those years were the first to answer the call when the United States entered World War I. They were on duty less than 24 hours after their commander received the call. So with that little bit of background, I'd like to share a group of objects that have their origin in the World War I era all used by two families with USS Wolverine crewmen who served in World War I. Now, this is a Blue Star service flag from Erie Maritime Museum's collections. Most people associate the Blue Star flag with World War II, the era in which it was made official and standardized, but all three examples I'll present now are from World War I. The blue star centered on a white rectangle, which is centered on the red flag, represents the family member on active military duty. A flag could have multiple stars if more than one man from a family served, 
and it would hang from the window lengthwise vertically with the hoist on top. The flag was actually designed and patented in 1917, and it was quickly adopted and displayed in the front window of homes by families of men on active duty. While many blue stars uh, flags displayed during World War I were handmade, this flag you see here was commercially produced, a testament to the popularity and demand for service flags in 1918. This flag currently measures 14 and 7 eighths inches by 23 and 3 quarter inches and is machine stitched made of cotton muslin. This flag was proudly displayed by the family of William Henry Stein. Uh, the USS Wolverine was one of several Navy vessels he had served in along with USS Rhode Island and USS Washington. While serving in Wolverine in Erie, he met Layla, La, or I'm sorry, Layla, uh, daughter of Erie Harbor Master Henry Seidel. Their courtship continued via postcards after William left Erie to serve in USS Maine. They married on June 18, 1917, and were briefly at home with Lila's parents in their West Public Dock residence. Um, and then William was called to serve again. That home was where this flag was displayed. Now, William served as coxswain in USS Shamut, part of Mine Squadron One in the North Sea. This was extremely hazardous duty. Every ship in the squadron was just packed with explosives. Uh, you see Shamit here in her dazzle camouflage, uh, typical of World War I. In five months, Mine Squadron One planted 56,571 mines in the 250 mile North Sea Strait between Scotland and Norway. Now, William was released from active duty in January 1919, honorably discharged on March 4th, 1922. He and Lila raised their family in their new home uh, near the waterfront. He died in 1948 and is buried in Erie Cemetery. This child's ring is another commercially produced blue star flag object from the Maritime Museum's collections. The flag motif is applied in enamel uh, in a cloisonné method on sterling silver, centered between two US Navy eagles with shields. This ring was found with family mementos of William Leverett Morrison's service in World War I. This child's ring could have been worn by his daughter, Anne Bliss Morrison, who had just turned 12 when her father's World War I service began. Lieutenant Commander Morrison was in command of the Wolverine from 1910 until 1923. On Tuesday, April 10th, 1917, he led the march from USS Wolverine docked in Erie to Union Station as Wolverine's crew was deployed just four days after war was declared. Morrison was first lieutenant in USS Utah, sent from the Chesapeake to her new station at Bantry Bay, Ireland. As the flagship of American Battleship Division 6, Utah con covered convoys against uh, Morrison was still with Utah when she escorted the liner SS George Washington carrying President Woodrow Wilson from Britain to Brest, France for post-war peace negotiations at Versailles. Released from active duty on June, January 8th, 1919, he returned to his family ear in Erie and resumed, uh, resumed command of Wolverine. The final piece in this group is a sweetheart's locket, a gilt metal ring holds glass on each side encasing ribbons. One side reveals a blue ribbon with a white central stripe containing blue, uh, three blue service stars, a handmade adaptation of the blue star flag. 
The multicolored ribbon on the other side represents the national colors of the allied powers. The blue star flag emblem was often incorporated into personal items as an intimate reminder of loved ones serving overseas. Three blue stars on this locket's flag represent three members on active duty. It may have been worn by Catherine Mack Morrison to remember her husband, William Leverett Morrison, along with her two brothers, Fred Mack and Charles Watson, who served as soldiers. Catherine and William had been married in 1903. Now, one more note about blue star flags. When a family member was killed in action, the blue star was replaced by a gold star as seen in this poignant poster from World War I. The blue star flag remains in use today by families. Our PHMC museums are also proud to participate in the Blue Star Museums program welcoming active duty military personnel and or their families with free admission to our museums. Thank you for your service and thank you for listening tonight. Thank you, Linda, and thank you for reminding all of us that indeed we are um, part of the Blue Star uh, program. So that was uh, Linda with Erie Maritime and her collection of objects uh, focused on the history of the Blue Star. Uh, next in our alphabet of museums is Jennifer Royer and uh, the Nisley family collection at the Landis Valley Village and Farm Museum. So uh, Jen, the screen is yours. Good evening, I'm Jennifer Royer from Landis Valley Village and Farm Museum. And I'm gonna tell you a story, the story of the Neasley family and the Pennsylvania German needleworking tradition. It is also the story of two separate modern day collectors who through their thoughtful collecting and generous donations allowed Landis Valley to reunite six of the Neasley family artifacts without them even being aware that this was happening. The first collector made a donation to Landis Valley in April, 2022, only two months ago. The donation included four Neasley pieces that were owned and created by Fanny Neasley, who lived from 1821 to 1888. In 1836, at the age of 15, Fanny created this cross dish sampler that she bound with a silk ribbon and corner rosettes. Family, Fanny used traditional Pennsylvania German motifs to fill her sampler. The domestic items consist, consisting of a pair of ladder back chairs, a stretcher based table, and a wine set were popular motifs among the Mennonites of Northwestern Lancaster County. Pennsylvania German girls created a sampler to record cross stitch designs that could later be used as a pattern to copy onto other textiles they later chose to decorate such as show towels and tablecloths. On the sampler, they would practice embroidery motifs, stitches, and alphabets that they would learn from the older women in their family. They would copy their grandmothers, mothers, and older sisters samplers and embroidery projects. Samplers were for, for, were for practice. I want you to take note and remember the deer that family, Fanny cross-stitched onto her sampler. This collector also donated two show towels that were created by Fanny Neasley in 1837 and 1839. This is 1837 show towel. Show towels were long linen panels that were hung on a door to showcase the fine needlework and typical Pennsylvania German motifs produced by women in the family. They were made to beautify the home. Typically, a Pennsylvania German girl first stitched her sampler and then within a few years would complete a show towel. Fanny completed this show towel only one year after finishing her sampler. Please note that she added the pair of ladder back chairs, stretcher based table, and wine set from her sampler to the show towel. Also, the deer have reappeared. Remember to keep those deer in your thoughts. 
This is the 1839 show towel made by Fanny Neasley. She once again added the pair of ladder back chairs, stretcher base table, and wine set, and those deer. We often tell the story about how the sampler came first to practice on, and then the show towel was for show. It was the final product. However, until this donation, we never had a sampler and show towel in the collection from the same girl to actually show this tradition. Two years after completing the second show towel, Fan Fanny married Jacob W. Snyder in 1841. They eventually owned her parents' Raffo Township farm and had seven children. This New Testament was a gift from Fanny's parents upon her marriage. It includes a book plate and proctor drawing attributed to Heinrich Kaiser, Raffo Township, Lancaster County. From a folded sheet of paper, Schoolmaster Kaiser created a two-page Proctor book plate that was then sewn into Fanny's New Testament. Kaiser recorded in German that the Testament was for the use of Veronica Neasley. He also recorded her birth and then closed with a religious warning. On the front page, he created a floral design. The next piece of the Neasley family story comes from a different collector who has made two large donations of tablecloths to Landis Valley in 2021 and in 2022. When I was picking up this year's donation, he mentioned we were receiving one of his favorite tablecloths and it was made by Mary Neasley. After our drive home and a little bit of research, I determined that Mary Neasley, also known as Maria, lived from 1824 to 1898. She was Fanny's younger sister. She hand wove this tablecloth in 1843. It is a two panel cloth joined by a band of pulled thread work. Each end of the thread work has a block of linen with a cross stitch name, date, and Pennsylvania German motifs. Now I remember that Pennsylvania German girls would use the samplers of the older women in their family to learn patterns and motifs. Here is older sister Fanny's deer reappearing on younger sister Mary's tablecloths. I made the connection to the final piece of the Neasley family story when I received an email from that tablecloth collector. The email read, a tablecloth in last year's lot is marked Anna Bomberger, 1809. Anna was Mary Neasley's mother. After receiving this email, I knew that this tablecloth was made by Mary Neasley's mother and Fanny Neasley's mother. This connection would not have, would have been a whole lot harder without that collector's information because Anna wove the tablecloth prior to getting married using her maiden name. Anna was born in 1791. She died in 1881 and married Mary and Fanny's father Martin Neasley in 1810. That was one year after creating this hand woven, plain weave, single panel tablecloth. You can see on the right, it says Anna Baum. On the left, it reads Burger. There are no deer on Anna's tablecloth. However, you may have noticed these designs. They also appeared on Fanny's sampler and on her 1839 show towel. She, Fanny most likely copied them from her mother's work, even if she put her own little spin on them. That is the Neasley family history and how we connected six artifacts from two donors back to the same family. Now, Mary's sampler is supposedly still out there owned by a private collector. Maybe one day we'll connect it, reconnect it with our tablecloths and the pieces created by her mother and her sister. Thank you. Thank you. Gosh, the treasures we have at Landis Valley and PHMC. Excellent. Thank you very much. So our final presentation, uh, last but certainly not least, is Sarah Buffington uh, from Old Economy Village. We'll kind of keep in the theme of textiles, and she'll be sharing a collection of four uh, harmonist dresses. So uh, Sarah, the screen is yours. Thank you. So 
So I'm presenting about a quartet of dresses. I'm Sarah Buffington, the curator at Old Economy Village. Um, there are three of them that you can see here on the mannequins. Um, they are dressed in the typical harmonist way. This is, these are kind of dress clothes instead of um, work clothes. The Harmony Society was a group of celibate um, communal um, people that came from Württemberg, Germany in the early 19th century. So they kind of kept with their ways of dressing. So these three dresses um, are basically the same pattern. <clears throat> they are the same fabric. And um, this is important also because the um, Harmony Society produced silk in the early 19th century. They started um, probably around 1825 or so. And um, by 1840, they had a jacquard loom to make um, jacquard textiles out of silk. And um, that's what these dresses are made out of. So all of the... Um, the clothing you see here is their silk. The only thing that's not silk are the little white ruffs around their necks. So these three dresses are um, very much alike. And then um, there is something really neat about two of the dresses. One of them is marked L for, um, well, it, it's not known exactly from the cataloging what the L stands for. A second dress is marked S. These are both cross-stitched inside the bodice of the dress, but the S marked one also has the name Sibylla Hinger written in it. And Sibylla Hinger was a harmonist and her sister was Logina Hinger. So I am making the connection that the L is for her sister and maybe they cross-stitched these at the same time. Now the fourth dress is not in very good shape. And you notice it's a different color. Um, the picture that you see is someone in probably the 1950s wearing this dress. And I have a feeling that's why the dress is not in very good shape because people wore it. Um, so this, this dress is made from the same pattern as the other dresses, but it has an added Bertha on the front of it. You see the folded um, pieces of fabric across the, the bodice. Um, that is a decorative um, part of dresses that kind of appeared in the um, 1830s and 40s. So you'll see that that is something that kind of carries over. Um, so you have those two dress or those four dresses. So I have also discovered that Sibylla Hanger, Logina Hanger, Gertrude Rapp, and Sibylla Herlebus were all um, members of a quartet. These are their music bo books. They're um, all different parts that they sang in um, all together. So these are all dated from 1827 from Economy. So Gertrude Rapp was the leader of the silk industry at Economy. And you can see their um, their life dates here. So Gertrude was in charge of the silk industry and she, um, that, that was quite spectacular for a woman to be in charge of an industry. And so she was always writing to people all over the country about how to make silk. And she was teaching people and sending silk cocoons different places. But if you're working in a quartet, you're most likely going to be um, kind of close friends with them. All four of these women were born in Harmony, Pennsylvania, right around the same time. This was right before celibacy was adopted in the Harmony Society. They grew up together. And um, I am putting all of these pieces together to think that perhaps these four dresses, which I've dated to approximately 1840 by all of their features on the dresses, um, that these may have been their dresses and that they were saved from that time. 
those blue dresses are in spectacular condition. It's amazing to see them. Um, but then I came across this newspaper article from the 1890s and it's not dated. It's not, um, this is in our, our research file, but no one wrote down which um, newspaper it came from. But from all of the things in it, I can say that it was from the early 1890s. Well, in this, um, Cyrus Reed Teed was someone who wanted to come and kind of be the, the um, second coming of Christ in a way. And he, he wanted to show up in George Rapp's famous um, velvet coat, which a lot of people call it a robe. And so this article talks about it, but it also talks about a room that had all sorts of relics from the Harmony Society. And in there, it says that there were, besides the dresses of seven singing girls who since wearing them had grown to womanhood. So I really think that these are the dresses. Um, and those are the people who they probably uh, belong to. We have other ones that are also in the collection that are similar, but they're not the same pattern exactly as this, these, these four dresses. <clears throat> so there you go. I think that the, the pink colored one is probably Gertrude Rapps because she was um, the head of the silk industry. And I have a feeling the one on the left, the blue one on the left, I think was Sibylla Harlebaus. The one in the center was Lugina Hanger's dress and Sibylla Hanger was on the right. So thank you. Wow, a collection and a detective story. Great. Yes. <laughs> thank you, um, Sarah. Um, just for those of you uh, in the room, uh, we did have um, a question addressed to Linda of, um, did the Wolverine see action during the Civil War? And Linda responded, the, um, the Wolverine slash USS Michigan served exclusively on the Great Lakes and served as a deterrent to Confederates who may have um, attempted activity on our Northern border. Um, anything else to, to add to that, uh, Linda? Oh, there we go. <laughs> oh. um, there was an incident where uh, the Confederates made an attempt to seize a vessel called the Philo Parsons uh, on the Great Lakes during the Civil War. And of course, uh, USS Michigan intervened. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, for those of you in the room, do you... Uh, are there any other questions for our uh, speakers uh, that you would like to um, pose uh, tonight? Um, Sarah, I see that it seems that the clothing was using hook and eye for closure. Did they have similar beliefs as the Amish about the non-use of adornments such as buttons? Um, we don't know that I have learned a lot about um, harmonist clothing by studying the Amish clothing. Um, they're not the same, um, they, they didn't believe in the same exact things, but they, they did all come from Germany, they came um, in that Germanic places. Um, but you don't, you don't see buttons on women's clothing. You just see hooks and eyes, but there are buttons on men's clothing. But that is also the same thing that you see in Amish um, clothing. You'll see it on men's clothing, but not on women's. And um, but you know that's also a holdover from the 18th century when people would um, the women would be sewn into their dresses or pinned into their dresses. Um, you didn't see hook and eyes quite as much. So great, uh, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Let's see. Um, 
Any other questions for our um, for our speakers? Okie doke. So as I said at the beginning, uh, uh, you've heard our uh, presenters from um, Erie and Blue Star, Jan and the Nisley um, collection, and uh, Sarah and the uh, dresses of old economy, and then the, Susan presented the unique collection of, of engines and archival material from Drake's Well. We will be, I'll be posting up a poll in just a moment where you can select the stories, the collection that you connected with through their story, through something that connects to your own experience. Please only vote for one. And um, also, uh, please um, uh, tick the box next to the, the name of the museum. So here we go. Hopefully this will work. Okay, I have launched, uh, launched the, the, the poll. And I'm not seeing any votes registered. So uh, is there an issue with the poll? Can you, oh, here we go. Tick the, tick the box next to the name of the museum, Linus Valley Museum, Reed Collection, Old Economy. Um, Erie Maritime Museum and Landis Valley. So click uh, click next to the, the name below. Uh, I had to tick the blank boxes on the other three for it to register. Interesting, okay. The miracles of modern modern technology. So let's see. Imagine the uh, Jeopardy music playing in the background. You may have to tick the, the blanks. Sorry for making, um, making it confusing. Okay. I will end uh, the poll in just um, a moment. Okay, uh, thank you, Charles. It will not uh, register unless you click the blank boxes and the ones you do not vote for. <laughs> so my apologies. Uh, Well, it looks like um, a majority of the group has um, selected their choices. So I'm going to end the poll. Um, a couple of things before I announce the result. First, uh, many thanks to our speakers for uh, taking time out of your busy schedules and your evenings tonight to share the uh, unique items in your collection. Our next uh, showcase will take place on July 14th. Uh, 
at 7 p.m. I believe the, uh, the theme initially selected is crime and punishment. So that will be uh, on uh, the PHMC uh, site uh, calendar. And there is a link in the chat box. So um, without further ado, again, thank you for all that um, presented. But I am pre pleased to share with you that the collection that got the greatest number of votes is, drum roll, please, <laughs> once again, is Landis Valley Village and Farm Museum. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, with that, uh, congratulations, uh, Jen, and thank you to all of um, our presenters. Thank you for joining us on this uh, fine summer evening for our monthly collection showcase uh, presentation. Uh, really appreciate you sharing your evening with us. So, with that, thank you for joining us. Uh, hope to see you at the sites and have yourself a, a great evening.